designer with over eight years experience in design. Her background is in design anthropology and she specializes in eco graphic design, website and BI application design. We also have Zach Anstey, our managing consultant for BI. He is a thought leader in marrying design and BI technologies including mobile deployments. For today's agenda, I'll be giving you a brief background on Trident and then hand you over to Michael who will kick off the session. Sonia will then be presenting on Back to Basics, working with principles of design and will be followed by Zach who will showcase some real life working examples. At the end of this session, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you wish to ask a question, use the raise the hand feature or submit your questions in writing using the question box on your dashboard. Trident is a leader in the, the design and implementation of technology solutions optimized for planning, reporting and analytics. Key to our success is our status as a multi-award winning IBM Premier Business Partner where we have achieved triple gold accreditation in BI, TM1 and CDM. We are also supported by additional VI technology vendor partners. Trident has formed strong, long-standing relationships with our clients from a variety of industry sectors, working with six out of ten largest companies in Australia. We have established offices throughout Australia and have even recently opened up an office in Singapore. Last year we were awarded IBM Solutions Partner of the Year and this success was mainly due to our people's commitment, creativity, proven industry practices and authenticity in solving challenging client business problems in the field of business performance and analytics. I will now hand you over to Michael Taylor who will be giving some context around today's session. Thank you Angela. Hello everyone, good to see plenty of familiar names on the attendee list and some new ones also, that's always good. So in terms of the context for today's session, uh, dashboarding obviously is just one of many elements or capabilities found in leading BI tools today. And I think it's true that it's a heavily overused and sometimes misunderstood term. We're not really here today to put some definitions around what dashboarding is, um, but one thing is for sure, in my 11 years in this industry, um, dashboard design continues to be front of mind for many organizations. Uh, I think it's fair to say that many of you will likely be familiar with the work of Stephen Few. Uh, if you haven't heard of Stephen, definitely look him up. To be clear, uh, we absolutely support many of his design philosophies. It would be remiss of us uh, not to pay our due respects there. Um, however, definitely in our experience, there is still a bit of a gap in the market. A gap remains and that gap is knowing how to ensure design best practices materialize successfully and aesthetically within the BI tool. So I have many organizations tell me they're frustrated by the fact that they are still yet to realize some of the nice things they've seen during sales or pre-sales demos or that it's just difficult producing visually appealing and effective displays. I get that feedback a lot. So that's where that gap is uh, and that's what we're trying to help address here. So next slide please, Angela. So let's touch on this concept of familiarity and I think if there's one thing I'd like everyone to take away from today, familiarity is indeed a fundamental concept to good dashboard design. Uh, I've got a little diagram here, a little picture actually, and um, it's a little bit of a cute example from the real world but I like these analogies. So what we have here is the BMW owned new Mini which was developed from 2001 to 2013 and curiously what they have here is a centrally mounted speedometer. I'm not sure if any of you out there actually own one of these or have driven one before. A couple of years ago I hired one from Melbourne Airport and I found it a little bit daunting in the fact that the, the speedometer was in the middle of the car and I was sort of uh, looking for something behind the steering wheel. Pretty sure there was a, a little digital readout uh, behind the steering wheel. It gave me my speed but it wasn't big enough and I I still found myself looking to the center of the car. just found that really odd. I um, did a little bit of research on this and, and we know that Apple 
is renowned for very good user interface design. So I jumped on the developer website there and their belief is that the user's mental model is based primarily on experience. That means it's experiential. There's a bit of memory effect there. I think it's fair to say pretty much every car I've ever driven, Speedo has been behind the steering wheel. For some curious reason, BMW and Mini decided to whack it in the middle and I think that was to pay some homage to the old Minis back in the 60s that had the Speedo in the centre as well. Next slide please, Angela. So it's interesting to find out what they've actually done for the 2014 model Mini and what you'll see here on the next slide is a screenshot of the new dashboard interior. So this is indeed a dashboard and look what they've done. So for 2014 onwards, we've got something much more familiar. In the middle of the car you've got satellite navigation capability and lo and behold the speedometer has returned back to its rightful place behind the steering wheel. And to use a quote that I found on the internet, um, basically they've had an interior design overhaul that will see next generation move to a more functional design. I think this is a really key point. Um, I think it's also very important to distinguish dashboard design for enterprise BI tools as opposed to capability afforded by some of the emerging visualization and exploration tools such as Tableau or Data Watch. I think it's important for us to point out that we see these as complementary tools to enterprise BI, not competing products. Um, but what you'll find with some of those products is there's oftentimes a lot of exploration going on, a lot of moving parts, which is great if you have a need for that speed of thought analysis and exploration. But we firmly believe enterprise BI tools have a firm place. There's absolutely a very strong case for that robust enterprise BI tool and one that supports the notion of familiarity. Okay, so if there's one thing you do take away from today, it's this cute little example here. What we're going to go to next is a, a short video and then Zach is going to take you through some real world examples of how we've done some aesthetics and design work on some dashboards for our customers. Thanks Angela, back to you. Hello and welcome to my session on working with the principles of design. In, I'm Sonia Meyer and I'm a graphic designer for Trident. So in my section of the webinar, we're really going to go back to basics and try and map out what exactly makes design work. More specifically, I want to discuss how we can get it to make sense in the context of data visualization for Cognos, where a user is presented with constantly changing information and data so that they can sort of properly understand this information that they're viewing with as little effort as possible, which will in turn help to fuel better decision making. What can you take from this today? So you'll appreciate the importance of a pragmatic approach to the design of the dashboard interface and the visualization of your data. You'll also understand when to balance this with creative insights and how this informs better decisions in the design process. Contrary to popular belief, design isn't all about creativity and artistic flair. There's a very practical framework, I suppose, to design that is the same for all design disciplines. Um, it's very universal and by understanding this you can take away some of the creative guesswork that can be quite paralyzing in visualizing your data in a way that works aesthetically. We'll also learn how to better engage our user or audience and so I'll explore the ways that we comprehend what we see and how changing one or two of these things can make this comprehension process much easier and more straightforward. And you'll see how easy it is to create consistency between the way that your data looks, the way your dashboard interface looks and your company brand in general, so tying it all together in an easy to recognize format. The most, I would say the most important thing <coughs> in uh, design and the first thing anyone will learn in a design course are the principles of design. So these are balance, harmony and unity, similarity and contrast, emphasis, scale, proportion and hierarchy. So these things which we're going to go through today really define the structure and general configuration of any successful design. 
like I said, they're very universal. So if you look at something around you that has been designed, which is a lot of things in your environment, whether it's a user interface or a poster, a logo, a chair, or anything at all, and if it looks wrong or strange in some way, then chances are that whoever created it missed a valuable component of these principles. For designers, um, over time, these principles sort of become like second nature. You don't think about them, you just know that they're sort of influencing your decision making as you work through the conceptual process. I'm going to start off with balance. So balancing something that's visual is kind of a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. It's about distributing elements across the design to create a layout or a composition that's visually appealing. You have to pay attention to things like the alignment of elements. So the more your design works on a grid, um, the more balanced it will be. Uh, also spacing between elements is very important. Um, also the relationship between the different sizes of elements on the page and how differences in tone, tone differences can change the depth of a design. So for example, darker tones and colours always appear denser than lighter tones, which really draws your energy or attention to the heaviness in that space. So you can think about balance, balancing something in a more 3D way than 2D way. 2D design is never truly flat. There's always some sort of movement going on. Balance in design is kind of like a visual interpretation of the gravity in the design. If it looks heavy in one corner, uh, the best way to balance this is by putting something quite heavy in the opposite corner. There are three types of balance and these are symmetrical, asymmetrical and off balance. And yes, strangely enough, off balance is also a way of balancing a design. Um, that is if it's done correctly, of course. So when I'm designing a dashboard layout, I try to stick to the first two. I'll use symmetrical when most of the charts are a similar shape and size and asymmetrical when I'm working with a range of different shaped or sized elements. Um, in designing for Cognos though, I really try to steer clear of creating an off-balance layout. I find that the medium in this environment much more suited to symmetrical and asymmetrical as it generally keeps the information clean and more simplified, which is exactly what we want to achieve when we're working with analytics, of course. So sometimes you might not have many charts to fit on a report page and you're left with a lot of empty space around it or you have just say one large chart and a small chart. In this case, you might want to work with an off-balance layout or you might have to. Um, but my first instinct would be instead to question whether it would be possible to alter the chart sizes slightly to create a more asymmetrical design or perhaps we could utilise the space and balance it out a bit better by adding a comment section or something else, so be a bit creative with it. Um, but it's important to know when to use these different balance scenarios. I'm more likely to use an off-balance layout if I were designing, for example, a page in an annual report where you have a lot of text-based information and it's more interesting and engaging for the reader if the placement of the text and images is a bit more creative. Moving on to harmony and unity. Harmony in design refers to the way all the components in a design relate to and complement the other components. So you could think of this as what defines the overall design style, I suppose. And it's important to understand the need for strength through consistency here. So to make a visual design harmonious, you have to think about things like the consistent use of certain color combinations, Colour is really important in keeping harmony. You have to also think about repetition um, of patterns and elements and colours. Harmony can also be achieved through the use of similar shapes to define certain elements in comparison with other elements. Unity though refers, uh, as opposed to harmony, more to the organisation of the design to create the greatest understanding and comprehension from the viewer, so keeping it unified, refining and removing anything unnecessary that could cause any kind of confusion. It's important to always keep it simple, I suppose, so yeah, just get rid of anything that isn't necessary in the design. But harmony can also be considered in broader terms. For example, how does the design style work within the overall brand and in this particular context versus other mediums? 
in this example of an actual dashboard, I just wanted to go through how I've created Harmony here. You can see the repetition of particular shapes throughout the design. Um, this rounded edge here, this keeps it harmonious. You can also see um, the use of a very simple but effective colour scheme. So this blue in the header here is repeated throughout the design. It's in the icons and it's in the text. It's, yeah, it's throughout the design, keeping the colour scheme very consistent. Um, you can also see repetition of these boxes, these um, background boxes with the darker header. There's three of them here. And so repetition can also work with like a process of illumination. So, um, for example, this box here doesn't have the same design, so automatically the user understands that perhaps it doesn't fit in the same category of the other, as the others, or it's different somehow. Um, but what about uh, branding in general? So we all know that I suppose branding isn't just a logo or a design style. It's about much more than that. Um, I would suggest it's about the consolidated values of internal and external stakeholders, company vision, adaptability and sustainability. So how does this translate when designing for analytics? I would think about the user experience always to begin with um, and generally ask myself something like this. What what will these want to achieve, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well? And how can design make this easy and articulate brand values and vision? So if a brand is about all these things I mentioned, then it should really be observed through every process, the click of the button or the toggle between parts of information. The best way to begin working on this path is, and with this vision in mind, is to design to suit the current visual style that's already in place. So this way you won't go off track and create a style that doesn't work as part of the whole. Work with any existing digital or print branding graphics, shapes and colour schemes, style guides, that sort of thing, and aim for consistency and familiarity across all the media to further embed this visual style. Um, I think recognition alone should be a good starting point to make the information that's presented to the user easier to digest. But when there's no particular branded style to work with, and this does happen sometimes, I would create a simple palette of analogous or complementary colours that will work on all the graphs and charts. Stick to just a few colours to keep things tied together and uncomplicated. Um, if some graphs or charts call for a more comprehensive range of colours, though, then I would and this is obviously does happen, then I would develop a secondary palette that the developer or whoever can draw from to use in this case um, and make sure this really comp complements that primary style and colour scheme of the design and the interface. But if uh, the intended user is familiar with using certain colours for particular metrics in the current or previous reporting, then don't, I wouldn't change these unless it's absolutely necessary. To encourage a better user experience, I really like to try to avoid teaching user new things. Instead, I would look at ways of altering these already recognised colours uh, slightly to make them harmonious with the rest of the design. So in this example, you can see in the old report there's like a dirty brown colour and they're obviously very familiar with using this um, throughout their charts. At first glance, they would recognise this colour and understand the information quite easily. But So in creating something new, I've just um, moved it over into this burgundy colour. So it's still very similar and easy to recognise, but it fits in a lot better with the overall colour scheme that's going on in the new design. Uh, makes it all a lot more harmonious. The next one is similarity and contrast. So too much similarity in a design kind of appears uh, bland or dull because elements start to bleed together and lose their, any purpose that they have. So it's important to show contrast between the elements to keep the viewer really engaged and able to move their eyes from section to section easily. But you have to also allow some similarity in the design to ensure that the design holds this consistency and familiarity that I've been talking about um, between its components. So ways to create a good contrast 
include things like tonal variations of a single colour, using more than one colour, contrast and direction of lines and gradients, use of different textures like shadows and patterns, alteration of positioning, so don't always place everything to the left, make sure you contrast it with elements on the right, contrast the size of elements and also use various shapes throughout the design. Contrast really creates the impact in a design. It works best though when elements are completely different. So, because if you make something just a little bit different, it can be confused as a mistake. For example, if you were choosing fonts and you chose two slightly different fonts but similar, um, it would look far worse um, and more confused than if you chose two completely different but really complementary fonts. Um, in this example, I just wanted to show how I use have used similarity and contrast. So to begin with, you can see in uh, the shapes in the design, there's a lot of these sharp angled rectangle shapes, and this is contrasted with a rounded edge here. Um, but there's also a lot of similarity in that this rounded shape, for example, is used throughout the design. It's consistent. It's on the headline bars. It's in the header and it's in the legend here as well. And there's also a lot of contrast in texture. So in these header bars here in the charts, you can see a shadow, which really helps this part of the design to pop out, um, especially more so because it's contrasted with this very flat, um, non-textured background, white background box here. But there's also similarity throughout the design in the way that this texture has been repeated. So it's obviously on all of the, the head, header bars, but it's also here in the footer, so it hasn't been just used once. There's also a contrast in direction a lot throughout the design. You can see, for example, the text here. There's a lot of horizontal text, but there's also some text sitting on an angle here. So it keeps it interesting. Um, but there's also similarity in the direction in the design. So if you look in as a whole at the um, at the rectangle charts, at the rectangle shape of the charts, none of them are actually sitting vertical. They're all sort of horizontal, which keeps the direction all the same and very clean and simple. There's also a lot of tonal contrast. So the all of the actual data, the, the changing information on top of the chart here you can see that it's a, a lot darker in tone than its background. So it, it's, it stands out on top of the background. If the background were darker, it would probably blend in a bit and it wouldn't be as effective. But there's similarity in the use of this, this darker tone for the, these elements. So it's um, used in all of the charts. It hasn't just been done once. And it's, it's also used in all the different parts of the charts. So even though there's color differences in the actual different metrics in the chart, you, they're all still a darker tone than the background. Then moving on to emphasis. Emphasis is really used to create a focal point in the design, so creating too much emphasis can give the appearance that the design is really busy or noisy. Um, so it's important to create emphasis only for the things that really need to be noticed. In Cognos, this is often whatever information is important to the user at the time. Because of the nature of a dashboard, it's better to emphasize elements in the data visuals rather than the, the, data, like the dashboard interface, so the, the background design. You can do this through variation, things like variations in text sizes and weights, such as make, making something bold to stand out, like the bold text in, sorry, like making durable content bold here. Um, which really flags to the user this is something that can be clicked through. Um, also, you can create color changes. Um, we have to emphasize something, we have a, a commonly used traffic light system of green, amber, and red, which you can see here. And this sort of shows the user what needs attention straight away when they look at the chart. Um, other things that create emphasis are spacing and isolation. The more negative space there is around a chart or a graph or anything, the more it will stand out. Um, and placement and direction, so if it appears that all the lines in the design are pointed towards a certain focal point, then it means that whatever's in that space is probably quite important. 
I also just wanted to show uh, ways to emphasize text because even though it's quite straightforward, it's so often done um, wrong. You, obviously, you can use things like making text bold, italicizing it, making it larger than what's around it, capitalizing it, or reversing it from its background. But what I wanted to get across is that you really should only use a, a, a maximum of two of these different approaches to creating emphasis uh, on, any, on any text element. So, for example, you might want to make something large and uh, capitalize it, or bold and italicize it, or um, bold and reverse it from its background. So this is what I mean by maximum of two things. And this is an example of just a big no-no. Um, it, it's really not necessary to go crazy with emphasizing text with everything that you can think of, because it makes if everything sort of looks like this. It makes it look messy and noisy. You don't know where to look. You don't know really what is important. So like everything else, just keep it simple. Um, don't go over the top. And the next one is scale and proportion. In the art world, uh, say art world, there are actually mathematic calculations that can be done to create a perfectly proportioned composition. Um, Renaissance artists, specifically uh, Da Vinci, called this the divine proportion because he believed it is in everything around us and therefore must have come from God. Proper, proper proportion and scale can greatly improve the way a design communicates its message. So that's what I really want to get across in this section. Um, think about the beautiful realist art of sculptor Ron Murek. These, I think, would have a completely different effect on the viewer, or perhaps no effect at all, if they were life-sized instead of giant or tiny. Even if Ron is an incredibly talented and detailed sculptor, it's the sheer scale of them that makes them so special. So size and, and um, scale really communicates a lot. This shape, for example, is made up of a large rectangle and a small rectangle. But then this shape, which is also made up of a large and a small rectangle, um, appears much more appealing. Why is this? It's quite simple. It's just the fact that the bottom half of the shape is twice the size of the top, so it's, um, it uses the same measurements. Even if we put it next to a symmetrical shape, suddenly the symmetrical shape looks a little bit boring and monotonous in comparison. So I suppose one of things is we seem to be attracted to things that are quite in proportion but not perfect, not exactly the same as it becomes sort of monotonous. Um, as another example, in creating some traffic light shapes for the dashboard chart, I noticed that when I made all the shapes the exact same height and width, the red square looked far bigger than the other shapes. Of course, this is because the square holds more volume. It takes up more space inside the dimensions. So a simple resize made each of the shapes look far more closely related and in proportion. Um, in this example, I just wanted to show a real dashboard and how I've used scale and proportion here. I didn't actually realize I was doing it, which is what I mean by it becoming a bit like second nature. But this height here is exactly half the height of these headline boxes. And this whole header area is the exact same height as all of the charts. And then this spacing here between the charts is actually 1.5 times the spacing on the vertical um, axis here. So, but if you, I feel, take these out, then it's going to be exactly the same, exactly the same spacing. So it's very balanced in the way the proportions uh, have been used throughout this design. Um, so lastly, we've got hierarchy. Uh, which is really quite similar to emphasis, but is more about the order of flow and movement in a design, rather than just what's important in the design. So we don't want the user to stop dead on what's important. We want them to be engaged and continue to um, move through um, as part of the experience. It really dictates the order of the user experience. So this movement can be created through things like um, gradation of tones, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Um, size changes, so large to small or small to large or whatever, and positioning. So positioning is really quite important. 
in user experience design for e-commerce stores. Something as simple, uh, for example, as moving an order button or a buy now button across the page or up the page, uh, about 20 pixels, um, for example, can make a massive difference in sales for a company. And there are documented cases where this has happened, which is really interesting. So this is, I just wanted to go through what I mean by gradation of tone. In this example here, you can see that the header of the chart is actually slightly darker in tone than the chart itself. And you can also see that the, the heading, the chart text, uh, sorry, the header text here is slightly larger than most of the text within the chart. So automatically, you would look at this. This is more emphasized, um, and you would look at this from top to bottom. You would sort of flow in that direction, which means that you're going to understand what the chart is about before you look at the chart information itself, which is how we want the person to experience this particular chart. And then moving to this example here, you can see that even though those header boxes are quite small, and there's a lot of tonal changes here, which doesn't mean anything specific. It's very balanced, but it's, it's not telling us anything in itself. You can still see that this top section is probably the most important, and you would begin your experience at the top and move your way down. Um, the reason for this is you, it's, it's quite obvious through the fact that the text is really quite large. Um, and it's isolated, there's space around it. Um, so yeah, the way that a hierarchy works is, it, it really depends. It's just a matter of working out how to balance it and what works for each scenario. So to finalize my section of the webinar, um, I wanted to show something called the F pattern. This was recorded using an eye movement detector, which is a super expensive piece of technology. But all the recordings show pretty much the same thing, which is that we always view things, or at least in the Western world, I'm pretty sure it would be quite different in um, other parts of the world, from left to right and top to bottom. So um, you would kind of do something first at the top, you would be quite engaged and you would move your way through it. You might glance over here, glance over here, but, but eventually you would sort of lose interest down here. Um, so what this shows is that in terms of hierarchy, positioning is incredibly important because this is a pattern that most of us would use to move through something. So as a general rule, uh, I guess more important things should always sort of appear towards the top, things that you need, that you would like your user to see first should be at the top. Um, anyway, that's it from me. So I hope you enjoyed a kind of in-depth look at how the principles of design can be used to create really user-friendly data visualizations and dashboard interfaces for Cognos. Um, I'm Sonia Meyer, and now I'll hand you over to Zach. Okay, hello there everyone. Um, I think the, uh, the, the screen is just getting itself ready to show the, the presentation. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen now. So what I'm going to do um, first off, and I guess first uh, before I get started would be uh, just an observation of Sonia's presentation there and just some of the, the wonderful elements that she talks about. There's so much to think about um, and so, much, so many things which when I come to designing dashboards previously, I've never really ever considered. So it's quite incredible um, seeing that the, some of the art and the science come together with uh, some of these designs which, design, uh, which Sonia has challenged us to, to build in, in a real life example. And what I want to show now is just some of those examples, some which you just saw from Sonia's um, presentation, but I just want to give a little bit of background to them as well by showing where they came from in the first place. So first off, this is almost like a, a wireframe, just starting off with a bit of customer sitting down, sketching up a few ideas on, on a piece of paper, um, to then turning that and converting it uh, through graphic design and bringing it to life with all of those elements which Sonia just talked about. 
Second, we have uh, we have the, um, another one where it's an existing Cognos application, um, very compressed. Um, you know, probably not a whole lot of thought into design, and more about more of the, the operational side of the report. To then bringing those flavors um, where, where Sonia spoke about, you know, getting the tones right and the spacing right on the page. Another one. Um, this was more of a mock-up um, before going into a build component, with the final um, product um, being. Um, you know, a wonderful design using these great headline figures up the top where you're drawn to, and then as you work down into the detail to the second part of the of the page with that nice asymmetric layout which Sonia spoke of. Another very Excel, um, I guess, historic Excel-based report built in built in Cognos, but you can see someone with an Excel hat on putting this one together, and then the flavors of design come into it. Um, you know, with uh, there's a nice layout. You, you're drawn to, to those big numbers in the top left-hand corner, um, and not distracted by the noise that, that we saw before with uh, some of those bold colours. Um, a before, a lovely after, and uh, that's obviously one that Sonia spoke about earlier with those nice rounded components and the consistency and the, and the tie-through with all of the those sort of shouldered edges. Fantastic example here of um, one where a customer had. Um, their dashboard um, built in Excel. This actually went over two pages. There's so much content on there. They didn't know really where to look, and those bits which they they wanted to see, the font was so small they couldn't read it, um, and it was redesigned um, through using some BI concept of drilling through into the detail rather than trying to present everything at once. But here's some some you know, great um, great color and you know some great use of layout on the page. Again, using those headline figures up the top, detail down below, asymmetric design. Uh, probably one of my favourites here of a, of a nice kind of mock-up of, of what a, a scorecard is going to be, or not necessarily a mock-up, but a like a wireframe and design which went up to graphic design, and we're blown away when we saw what came back here, um, and, and so was the customer. Um, a fantastic use of graphics and colour and design that um, ended up in this one here. Um, and lastly, um, again, uh, a very kind of um, an unusual report here, I'm not really too sure what I'm trying to get out of this, um, but at the same time by just adding um, some, you know, some design flavors into it. I just want to look at it again and I want to spend a little bit more time digesting what's in there. The second part that I want to talk about after just showing some examples of how do we get to that point and how do we work with Sonia in the first place, um, and it's something which Sonia spoke about before, and that is um, the importance of getting involvement um, and customer involvement and your you know your end user involvement when going through that initial design component. <coughs> I've never seen a design get accepted more quickly than when the end users have involvement. Um, when they it could be as simple as um, changing a colour. You know they want that red to be blue, and if it is blue in the end, you know they're taking ownership of that design now. So it's important from the step one to get them involved um, and go through that design process um, about mocking things up, whether it's in Excel, grabbing old reports, re, you know, trying to understand the important components to understand the flow of how things work, or maybe it's a whiteboard session, you know, sketching things up on a page, and you might get through a few iterations before you get to a point where you start honing in on a on a high level design. From that, we then try and understand the flow. Uh, are they going to be drilled through? Um, you know, often a dashboard will be made up of an aggregated view of data, and then we want people to journey down and drill through and you know unpeel the layers of the, of, of the onion to get into, into that um, you know infinite detail down the bottom. So, what's that going to look like, and, and how's that going to translate into the design when it goes up to off to um, off to graphic design? Other things as well, we want to know how they're going to be using the report, you know, where are they going to be clicking, are they going to be swiping on an iPad, and how, you know, how do they do that currently, um, how they're going to be drilling, how they're going to prompt them for drilling or prompting for, for filtering and interacting with the report. Um, so it's all, you know, lots of questioning around that side of things. Um, capturing its standards, as again, as Sonia mentioned before, are there existing standards that we're trying to work to at the moment? Um, are, you know, uh, are actuals you know, a specific colour versus a budget being a specific colour? Um, so that you know, that's a recognised colour as soon as somebody sees the report and they see blue, that they know that that's going to be an actual. So we want to keep that consistency through into design. Or are there accessibility features which are required? A lot of government require you know, um, to catering for colour blindness. Um, or you know, is there um, you know usage of branding which we have to be very conscious of? Are there things around um, resolution size? So what's the end um, device going to be? Is it a is it an iPad? Is it a, is it just a, a mobile phone? Or is it a um, is it a widescreen monitor? 
Is it a plasma screen? You know, what is it that we're working to? What's the format going to be? Commonly, we're, we're usually dealing with HTML, but we do need to print things out. Um, so often, we need to make them PDF friendly. And if we are going to be um, print friendly, do we need to be light and ink? We don't want to have a big black design, which is going to hog all the, the, the printer ink. Um, and, and some companies do have policy around that. And we want to call out quite early on about customised icons and uh, components which we need, uh, which we start seeing very quickly are, are going to need customization from a graphics point of view. So we can get started working on those as soon as we can. So just as a quick example, um, here's, here's a, a real life design brief. There was actually a number of more pages to this design brief, but I just tried to show you that in that top left hand corner, there's um, a, a flow diagram about how, um, how the user would be interacting with each of the layers within the report through to the remaining, uh, the, the next kind of four slides which kind of show um, kind of call outs about you know, where the user will be clicking to drill through to a next report or some of the functionality which would be occurring on the page. So lots of, I tend to use the call outs um, and tend to use PowerPoint for doing those type of things. And then in that bottom right hand corner are some of those design considerations. Sometimes they go into the pages, sometimes they could be quite small, you know, that um, we know quite early on that um, it's just going to be a HTML report or that it will be just um, consumed on an iPad. The next part I'm going to talk about um, here is just about the approach and um, what uh, commonly what we'll be using when building the report in Cognos um, would be in Cognos BI would be Report Studio. We get the most flexibility, um, it's almost like infinite for things that you can do with a Report Studio right through to customising through to Java using JavaScripting. So if there's a, a lot of a lot of things you can do in there, you can get that real pixel perfect um, formatting, which often these designs which we're getting from graphic design really do need. So commonly um, and almost always we'll be using Report Studio to build these um, these dashboard reports. The second thing is then about what is the approach that we're going to take. So really um, faced with, with three main approaches when getting a, a design through from, from Sonia. And that would be um, wanting to build all of that design using the, the formatting capabilities out of the box within Report Studio. So using all those formatting properties, can we get everything that we need to do, those rounded shoulder edges, you know, some of the gradient colours, some of the layout pieces, can we do that all within the product itself? Which is usually the, the more ideal path to go. But sometimes we're faced with um, design elements which we can't build within the product and we have to start thinking about using um, background image and, and customised graphics which I'll, I'll show in a moment. And thirdly, um, and maybe um, you know, more realistically, it's, it's a combination between the two of trying to use as much Cognos properties as we can um, and, and complement it with some of the, the, the customised graphics and icons. So let me just give a, a couple of, um, just show you some of those pieces. I'm not going to go through many of them, but I've just called out that the use of using, um, and those who are Cognos developers um, and used to using uh, reports to get the properties in there. There's, there's a property in there called background effects, and in there you can do, uh, uh, there's a lot of things you can do in there if you do get creative. So the example there, and this is taken from one of the dashboards we've, which we've already seen, is that bottom right hand corner, we've got a, a box there with a, with a chart in it. Um, there's, a, there's a header section, the, the black piece um, with the rounded edges, and then we go into the body of that block, and in there, and it may be a little bit hard to see, but there's a gradient blue into a white, and then it goes back into a blue again with the rounded edges down the bottom. And we're able to achieve all of that via using the background effects. So on the top left, you'll be able to see that there's a number of colours. There's probably about seven different colours with different gradients and different um, points where we introduce a gradient to be able to get all of that to occur into the single object. So the fill and, and the different layers of colour with the fill combined with using borders and rounded edges allowed us to actually just do all of that via just Cognos, Cognos default properties. Comparing that to um, another um, design that we saw earlier where there was a lot of these um, rounded edges, as you can see up the top here we've got some very rounded edges for the, which is essentially the header and these blocks where we've got a little bit hard to see but there's almost like a 3D image going on there where it kind of sets itself back a little bit um, and also some of these teardrop elements um, within these little blocks here. We know that we can't do that in, in Cognos so what we do is that we get a, almost like a toolbox of, um, of these images which we can then put together almost like a jigsaw onto a page to eventually bring it together onto it to be a, a single dashboard. So I'm just going to flip back again you'll see now that you've seen the, the output 
and see the individual pieces. You slot them together on a page using a table as background images and you can get your page together um, and it's a, obviously a very nice design. The final trick then is to, on your background images, is to layer on top of that the Cognos objects, container objects. So we're talking about charts and grids and singletons and text items. Then sit on top of those um, background, uh, sit on top of those background images and there you've got this uh, wonderful designed um, dashboard. This last piece is just really about the hybrid approach. So here we've got a mixture of, as, as we can see in the body of the report, those blocks which we know have been built by using the, 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 background, um, the background effects, uh, the, um, the, the property effects. Um, and then we can kind of see there's other bits in here which are actually customised. So in the top right hand corner we've got like a little image, this is an iPad report and this was to signify to the user that they can fund that and they get presented with a box which allows them to drill through to other items which is a very iPad uh, common um, feature. We've got default buttons, so that's straight out of Cognos, but we've got some customised edges and borders and gradients going on in here which we knew that we just couldn't do within the product. There's little arrows, that, the little arrows to signify that there's actually a drill through to expand on that particular report to go to the next level of detail. That's a customised icon. So too is the top left hand corner back button. So it's a, it's a good mix. It's a good mix of customization, default. Um, and lastly here, I'm just going to talk very briefly around um, the use of using classes and property classes. So within Cognos, uh, Report Studio, behind every container object, again like a, a list or a chart or a crosstab, um, it has a, a set of global classes. So you can see these in the image down in the bottom part here, that these are the default um, global classes, which when you drag a crosstab onto your page and you get the very light grey borders in the, in the, in the measure part of the, of the crosstab and you get your light grey or light blue rows and columns, that's all controlled through the global classes, but you can create your own customised classes. And that's what's occurring up above there. In this particular project, we did many local classes, um, ranging from, and if you have a look at the, some of those names, that on a table we've got a padding of zero and it's centred and it's got 18 point format with a bold, with a white background, with a black track. So, you know, there's obviously quite a lot going on in there. And what we can do is then very quickly pick up that class and assign it to a reporting object on the page and there's benefits, obvious benefits to that. Firstly, is that we get consistency, so that we are always using the same type of formatting rather than each developer going off and doing their own thing. They call and use their classes whenever they're using a particular list or a crosstab or a block or a table that has this type of formatting assigned to it. Um, secondly, it speeds up development, so the, the developer doesn't need to go through and you can see just down in the bottom left hand corner all of those different property settings which are occurring to that class. That now it's been done once and now all they have to do is apply their class to it and all of those properties are assigned to it. So it speeds things up. And lastly, it actually helps with file sizes. Now file size is probably not so applicable when you talk about HTML, but active reporting, which is a fairly new concept to um, a lot of people in, in Cognos 10, um, is very, um, very uh, conscious of, of file sizes. So every time you add more properties and, and objects and anything into the, into the active report, the file size can grow. And as a, as a goal, as a developer, we're trying to bring down the size all the time. So the class becomes a single point of reference for an object and it's only applied once. It's stored in the class and just applied to that object um, rather than that, that same property setting potentially repeated 20 or 30 times between, uh, across the same report. So I, I guess in some ways that, that brings me to, to the close of, of the sections which I wanted to talk about. We know when it comes to reporting there's a lot of things, a lot of considerations when it comes to it, but there's a few things to get you kind of started and, and maybe thinking about different approaches. Um, firstly to do with make sure that you engage well with your, with your um, business owners and sit with them and work out how they work with information. Um, make sure that you capture a nice design document um, if, you're, if you're doing something internally. Um, secondly is just a, Take a step back at some point and think about your approach and because we know that there's one more than one approach to then just sitting down and building everything in Report Studio, there are graphics which can be used as well. And try and use classes where possible and especially if you find yourself using active reporting in, in Cognos 10, um, I think it's you know, almost a fundamental concept is to ensure that you're using your classes to keep those file sizes down. So, 
I hope you got some benefit out of that. Um, what I'd like to do now is probably take us to uh, a question and answers um, um, part of the, of the presentation. Um, I think we've got a, you know, around about 10 minutes left. Um, so I think as Angela mentioned earlier, um, if anybody would like to post a question via the chat box, um, I'll read out that, that particular question and, um, and try, and, try and give you an answer on the spot. Those answers which I, which I, which questions which I can't answer, we'll happily get back to you um, at a later time. So feel free to um, type a message. Uh, I'll give it a, a 30 seconds or so until um, and see whether we can get a few that come through. Okay, I've got one here, um, and it's just asking around, um, asking how hard it is to take what Sonia produces and apply it or integrate it into a, into the product. So they're asking, isn't that quite a big leap? Uh, isn't that quite a big leap? Um, I, I, I guess <clears throat> when it does come to that, um, yeah, it, it can be quite a big leap sometimes, but Sonia um, is, is quite aware of the product. I've spent considerable time with her, and she understands how Cognos works and some of the limitations there. So I think in the back of her mind, she often knows um, where there's going to be a limitation and where we're going to be using default properties and where we're going to be using graphics. Um, and that can be an iterative approach as well at times. So I guess the fact that she has that, that product knowledge um, really kind of, I guess, helps us on the, you know, the long-term development of the, uh, of, the, of the design. Okay, I've got a, a, another question here, um, and it's just asking about the, the usual turnaround time for a design mock-up to be generated. Um, wow. Okay. So that that can that can vary. So that can be uh, it can be very rapid, and it can be uh, you know it can, it can be a one day exercise in regards to Sonia going off and doing it, um, or it can go on for, for many days. Um, and we have had customers where we've produced five different designs by their request, um, so that they can choose as to which one they wanted the comparison. They want to be able to choose of those five which one was most appealing. Um, and then those designs then, once we honed in on one, went through iterations of, of tuning it. Um, and that was for a customer who was, it was a big customer and it was at a C-level and an executive level, so they need to make sure that this thing is perfect. And that actually went on for a number of days. That was a good five days of, of design that went into that. But really, what, when you think about it, when it comes to design, we're doing this type of stuff anyway. So um, as a developer, we'd be doing we would be doing design. It's just that we're handing that task off to a designer to do the work, and we know a, a good job will be done. Okay, it sounds like somebody's uh, jumped off of mute. Um, is somebody wanting to, to jump in here? Um, I've got a question coming through to me, Zach. Uh, can you hear oh, me okay? Really? Uh, yes, I can. I'll jump on mute so that you can read that one out. Yeah, no problem. So I've got a question directed to me around what techniques can be used to ensure the report layouts work across different screen resolutions. Okay, that's actually a pretty good question because we know um, across an organisation people tend to have different monitor sizes and, and laptop sizes and that kind of thing. I think um, in our experience obviously using uh, relative or percentage based sizing is uh, an absolute must, and what you'll get there is if um, you know people are using that output against uh, across different screen sizes, it's going to automatically adjust to that resolution. So that's a very important thing to take into consideration. Um, I'm going to go out on a, a little bit of a limb here. Uh, we're actually involved in a lot of the IBM beta testing, so uh, we've had a look at um, 1022 and what's coming in the pipeline is in Report Studio, you'll now be able to select the targeted resolution if you really want to hone in and perfect the report for a particular resolution. So for those of you who are familiar with that development process, you click Run uh, on your report, there'll be a little bit of a drop down and you can actually pick the resolution that you're targeting at. So that's, that's specifically where you want to hone in on, let's say, an iPad Air, for example. Really good question, though. Um, there's another question that's just come in. Um, we're obviously talking about aesthetics. Um, so what's my experience of the new Cognos Rave engine? Another very good question. Sounds like people are, are quite up to speed on what's coming in the new releases. Uh, so last year I spent some time at IOD over in Vegas 
and uh, was actually part of some of the sessions where we learnt some of the coding and proven practice on how to leverage that Rave engine in the technology. Um, our experience has been good so far, so we've had a couple of organisations willing to take the leap uh, into using Rave. Obviously what you get in the tablet display is um, a really nice interface in that you've got some animation going on, you've got a series of new chart types which are very effective, particularly the bubble and the graph chart types. And I think there's another one coming called the Chord, specifically targeting if you're using something like SPSS and trying to understand correlations between things, the Chord display is very effective at showing correlations between items. Probably the only limitation we've seen so far, um, well there's two of them actually, that the size of the MHT file will be increased slightly if you're using the RAVE objects, not significantly, and we know that IBM have improved the product substantially since the first time that MHT active reporting was available. So that's not so much of an issue, um, but I suppose compared to the current charts, you don't always get as many properties uh, to manipulate that chart as what you would with a traditional bar chart, for example. But I do know in the next release in 10.2.2, they are considering introducing a bit of a better approach at exposing some of those properties around the RAVE objects. So hopefully that answers that question. Do some good questions flowing in. Um, any others? Angela or Astrid, are you seeing any questions come in on your side? No, no more questions. Terrific. Uh, obviously, if there are other questions uh, that um, come down the line, feel free to reach out to us, um, particularly if you're viewing the recording of this. Uh, so you've got contact details. You can go through Astrid or Angela, uh, who sent the invites out, and reach out to us. We'd be happy to help. So uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Okay, so I guess we're, we're wrapping things up now. Um, as Mike um, just thanked everybody for, for, for attending. Um, I'd like, just like to reiterate, um, appreciate everybody spending their time over lunch. Um, keep a little eye out. Um, there's a, a number of webinars coming up through, through Trident um, over, the, over the coming weeks and months. So do keep a, an eye out on, on the website, and I'm sure um, Angela will be sending out further information. Um, but in the meantime, thank you everybody again. Um, and uh, if there's any questions that, that come up, um, please thought, please send them through and uh, we'll be happy to try and help.